Will you turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Luke chapter 2? Luke chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. So my brothers and sisters, for a few moments, I just want to uh, talk about the, I want to talk about the context of the first Christmas, the context for the first Christmas um, as a way of talking about the context for a miracle, the context for a miracle. Uh, I, I say this, uh, I bring this because I was, uh, um, last night I was uh, watching a little bit of uh, the, one of the Charlie Brown Christmas specials um, and um, it was uh, one of my favorite things to watch around this time of the year and I love it when Linus gets up and uh, in the middle of all of the craziness and pandemonium while they're uh, upset at Charlie Brown and everything is going crazy Linus goes to the microphone and reads uh, recites the Christmas story and everybody falls in line and then starts singing joy to the world behind Linus as he tells the Christmas story. Um, and there is so much beauty um, and presence and strength in that story. Um, but sometimes uh, uh, we miss uh, a part of the story because we spend so much time focusing on what happens and we don't pay attention to what's happening around what happens. The, the context is part of what makes the story great. Um, so in this uh, particular uh, passage, the, uh, Luke, is, as he's writing this, I want you to understand, Luke is, um, he, he's trying to do a lot with a little space. Luke is really, um, writing as most of the gospel writers are. They're not just telling a story about Jesus. They're not just simply trying to give us a glimpse or a piece of Jesus's biography. They are writing, uh, if you will, a, uh, a political narrative about Jesus. They are talking about Jesus in the context of their political environment. Now, uh, the challenge is because they do not have uh, under Roman, uh, under the Roman Empire, they do not have a constitution the way we have a constitution. They do not have a Bill of Rights the way we have a Bill of Rights. Uh, so there was no guaranteed freedom of the press. Um, and therefore, uh, there was no guarantee that you would be exempt from persecution uh, from the government based on what you wrote. In fact, the opposite was true. Uh, if what you wrote uh, was seen to be subversive to the empire, you were guaranteed to be persecuted for what you wrote. And the number of writers uh, and authors and scholars who were arrested and tried and sentenced to death because of their views uh, is too many uh, to accurately keep count of. Um, and so Luke is writing in this time, and he's trying to write something about the political environment, but he has to be careful uh, because uh, while persecution is uh, a, a present thing and a prevalent thing at that time, nobody wants to be persecuted. Uh, uh, even when uh, Peter and Paul are writing to the churches in the midst of their persecution and they're saying things like, count it all joy, um, uh, they're talking about while you were in the midst of the persecution, but nobody uh, advises anybody to go and pursue persecution because uh, nobody wants to endure it if there is a way to avoid it. And so what Luke is doing in, in writing is Luke is really writing in code. He is, he's writing, uh, he, he's putting things secretly so that the people who read it will understand what's happening, but there's no proof to convict him of anything. This ought not be too f uh, unfamiliar for us um, who are the descendants of uh, men and women who were enslaved here in America. We ought to know a little bit about that code. Uh, 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 there is 
my father talked about it. He, he talked about the way uh, 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 double speak, a way of talking around uh, uh, in, the, in the presence of mixed company so that other black people knew what you were talking about, but white folk didn't know what you were talking about. He, he talked about that for himself and his generation. Uh, our, our ancestors used to sing code. Uh, there were songs that they would sing that had coded messages in on them. And uh, even uh, in our devotion uh, growing up, some of the deacons would sing those old songs that had uh, some of the messages. They would uh, sing a song that says, shine on me, shine on me. I wonder if the lighthouse will shine on me. On me, and I and I I would I would uh, hear that song, and I um, I would think that they were talking about Jesus as the lighthouse shining, and they they might have been talking about Jesus in one part, but another part it really wasn't talking about Jesus. Uh, it was talking about there was uh, somebody was getting ready to run away, and they were wondering if they were gonna get caught. So they were that was a way of letting them know somebody's getting ready to run, y'all. So y'all gotta let people know when when mass is coming around, so that. They don't get caught while they're running. They would sing a song, this train is bound for glory. This train is bound for glory. This train is bound for glory. Everybody on it must be holy. This train is, and, and again, I, I would think this is a song talking about going to heaven, but it really wasn't. It was a song talking about coming up to Cincinnati and other places up north. Not that Cincinnati was glory, but it was... It, it was better than some of the places down south. It was, they were talking about this. There is, there is a, a, a group that's getting ready to leave tonight. And so if you planning on running, you better get ready because this train is, uh, you, better get, you better be ready to run when the train leaves the station. It was, uh, these songs had coded messages. This is what Luke is doing in the gospel. He is writing in coded messages. And so right here in these uh, first seven verses of uh, chapter 2, Luke is already putting to work some of the, the coded information you need to understand what's going to happen in the rest of the chapter. It seems like a throwaway line. Uh, about that time, Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the empire. This was the first census when Quirinius was governor of Syria. It seems like a throwaway line that tries to situate this historically. Uh, the challenge is that people who have studied the history of this uh, have cannot figure out which census Luke is talking about, that there doesn't seem to be any historical census that took place around the birth of Jesus. So they can't figure out what he's talking about. Uh, uh, and so some people, some skeptics will use that to dismiss this and say this is an anti-historical account or this really couldn't have happened because Luke's history was made up. Uh, uh, but they missed the point. Luke Luke isn't trying to tell you about the history of this. Luke is trying to give you clues as to what's happening on the political stage. Uh, so when Luke talks about Caesar Augustus, now uh, uh, this part is true. We do know that Caesar Augustus was Caesar around the time of Christ. And uh, my brothers and sisters, uh, Luke is trying to set up what's really happening in this story. See, if you read it, it's easy to see this as a contest between Jesus and maybe Jesus. Jesus and Satan, because we see Jesus and Satan wrestling with each other um, in, the, in the wilderness after Jesus is baptized by John, or maybe it's a contest between Jesus and the Pharisees because they're always grappling with each other about these rules and that rules and whether you welcome people in or do you have to wash your hands and all of this stuff. Or maybe it's a contest between Jesus and Herod and Jesus and Pilate because those are the people who uh, uh, judge over the the trials where Jesus is ultimately convicted and sentenced to death. Uh, but what Luke is trying to tell you is that all of those figures, all of those people are, are, are just distractions. They, they aren't the real power behind this. This is really a contest between Jesus and Caesar Augustus. They never meet each other. They never speak to each other. They never have words with each other. But this is really a contest between Caesar Augustus and Jesus. Now, uh, 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 the reason that I know that this is the case is because uh, Caesar and Jesus had a lot of the same things being said about them. Uh, if you don't believe me, see if any of these sound familiar. They would say of Caesar Augustus that he is the prince of peace. Uh, does that sound familiar? 
they called Caesar Augustus the Prince of Peace uh, because he was seen as not the biological son, but the, uh, uh, the governmental son of Julius Caesar. Uh, uh, he was the, the second in the line of the major Caesar, so he was seen as Julius Caesar's son, which would make him the prince, and he was the one who is said to have brought peace to the Roman Empire after the uprising, after Julius Caesar was assassinated. Uh, Rome, uh, the Roman Empire went into a, uh, uh, a time of war, and Octavian, as Caesar Augustus, his birth name was Octavian, uh, uh, as Octavian uh, 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 seized power and defeated all of uh, the other people contending for power. He ended the wars and brought peace uh, to Rome. Is that was the the claim, the proclamation about Augustus was he is the one who brings peace. So they called him the Prince of Peace. Uh, they also called Caesar Augustus. They also said he was the son of God. Uh, when he changed his name from Octavian to Augustus. Um, it was a way of saying that God had adopted him as a son, uh, that he was now more than just a king. He was now an immortal um, in the way that uh, many of the Egyptians uh, saw their uh, leaders as being immortal, in the way that uh, uh, other Roman uh, emperors saw themselves as being immortal in a way that uh, uh, kings throughout history uh, and uh, military and political leaders and sometimes even popes throughout history would declare on themselves uh, uh, the characteristics of deity. They would uh, consider themselves to be like a god in the minds of the people. Augustus was a part of this tradition. Uh, 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 this was the real contest between Jesus and Caesar, um, uh, not uh, a direct contest, but a contest of ideas, of, of, of whose God was really God. Uh, because Caesar, this isn't just about what name you worshipped, uh, but this was about what you did because of that. We, we've been saying, we've been trying to make the case, my brothers and sisters, that our worship of God and our belief in Jesus is not just about the names that we say or what we proclaim about them. It's not just about what we believe, but it's about what that belief causes us to do. It isn't just about the songs we sing in the house, but it's about how we live those songs when we leave the house. It isn't just about the scriptures that we read during service, but it's about how those scriptures compel us to live when we walk outside of service. So the contest between Caesar and Jesus was not just a contest of names, right? This wasn't just a, a brand of whose church is better. But this is really a contest of ideas of what society looks like. Because while Caesar's claim of bringing peace to the empire did have some truth and validity to it, the way he brought peace to the empire was ultimately dangerous and counterproductive. Caesar brought peace by beating down all of his enemies. By using the military might of Rome to crush anybody who would dare raise up against him and then using that same military might to keep them oppressed. Now, uh, to, to see the contest between Caesar um, and, uh, and the way that, that, that God rules, all you have to do is understand that the reason why Luke moves Jesus from Nazareth to Bethlehem is to connect Jesus very closely with David. This is the, he wants you to see Jesus coming out of the lineage of David, who was the, uh, uh, the great figure in Israel's history, who was a king, but operated, who tried to operate out of a sense of justice. Not that David did it perfectly, but David was, there was an ability to call David on the carpet for what he did wrong. Uh, David uh, led the people of Israel in battles, um, but uh, when the battles were over, there were people who were brought in uh, and were treated fairly or treated rightly, or at least were supposed to under David's camp. 
uh, the big issue with David, uh, everybody remembers David and Bathsheba, where David uh, takes Uriah's wife and then kills Uriah uh, the Hittite. Uh, Uriah as a Hittite was not, uh, uh, he was not an Israelite. In other words, he was not a native to the people. David had no allegiance to Uriah by birth or by uh, nationality. Uriah was a stranger, a foreigner in the land. However, when David has Uriah killed in order to take his wife, uh, that uh, the prophet Nathan comes and holds David accountable for that because even the Hittites, even the strangers, even people who don't belong to the group have the same rights as the people in the group. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from, you still have the same rights. And if you steal from somebody else and take their life, the fact that they aren't part of the nationality doesn't cover for that. God still holds you accountable for that. Uh, 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 this is the message that we see in David. It's a very different message than we see in Caesar. In fact, under Caesar, what Rome did uh, was Rome would come in, uh, not only would they beat you militarily, um, and not only would they kill anybody who stood in opposition to them, but they would take everything you've ever done and take it and claim credit for it and burn any record that you ever did it. This is the reason, my brothers and sisters, that history has so little record of, uh, uh, of the contributions of ancient uh, Egypt and other African nations, uh, their contribution to, uh, to world knowledge and world history. And Rome and Greece are seen as the pinnacle of knowledge. It wasn't because they were all that smart. They really weren't all that smart. They, they were a little smart, but uh, uh, what they did was they stole from everybody they conquered, and then they burned their libraries. And so if you all were to gather great knowledge together and have all of these records of your great knowledge, and then I come in with my army, take all your books, copy them all in my name, and say I'm the one who wrote the books, and then burned uh, all of the originals, nobody would know that you all were the... Uh, that you all were the architects of great knowledge. Nobody would know that you all invented mathematics or uh, that you all invented poetry, that you all invented drama. They would give me the credit for it because I have all, because I was the one who controlled the records. And this is how Rome got to be in the mythological place it has been uh, in world history is because they were great at going in and destroying everything around them um, and then claiming credit for all of the knowledge. This is what Caesar Augustus did. He had an aggressive military campaign of not only conquering nations for political grounds, uh, but also destroying knowledge to make him and his uh, people look smarter than they really were to create this mythological uh, image of Caesar and Caesar's people as being uh, 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 greater than everybody else, which reinforced this notion then that Romans were better than the rest of the world. And so now there was a political agenda behind this because Rome had special privileges. You could not uh, harm a Roman. If a Roman was walking through your nation and somebody harmed the Roman, then the army would come and indict and penalize everybody who was uh, a part of that town because you would not harm a Roman walking through. Uh, they had special privileges that you could be tried and convicted uh, and sentenced to death that quickly, but a Roman could not be. A Roman could not be convicted to death until his case was appealed all the way to Caesar. Only Caesar could kill Romans. Nobody else could. There were special privileges that came with that, that were reinforced by Caesar's uh, uh, defeat and oppression of all that was around him. And in the midst of that, in the midst of that, my brothers and sisters, it is in that context that Luke tells us of a man named Joseph who was engaged to a woman named Mary who walked from Nazareth to Bethlehem so that Jesus could be born. Now we know the story, we've heard the story, we know what Jesus is going to do. That Jesus is going to do the opposite of what Rome does. Uh, Jesus is not going to try to conquer people and oppress them, but Jesus' first uh, sermon in the Gospel of Luke is going uh, to say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. 
not oppression to the poor, because he's anointed me to release the prisoners, not to, uh, not to exploit the prisoners, uh, because he's anointed me uh, to, to, bring, to, to bring together those who were oppressed, to announce that this is the year of God's favor, the year of jubilee, to announce that God is doing a political as well as a spiritual and religious movement in our midst. Well, I hear somebody say, Reverend, this is a great history lesson of the Bible. And maybe it changes the way I read the Christmas story a little bit, but I don't understand uh, why you're preaching this today um, as opposed to this being a Bible study that could happen at any time. What does this have to do with us coming to worship and preaching today? Well, my brothers and sisters, uh, I simply want to preach this message today uh, because the, uh, they say history repeats itself. And while it doesn't repeat itself exactly that there are, uh, we see these things arise time and time again. Um, and it seems to me that we are in a time when we are uh, seeing the rise of another oppressive leader in our midst. Another person who wants to uh, try to bring peace and unity is what he said. He wants to unify the nation, but the way he uh, is, uh, appears to unify the nation is by oppressing anybody who does not think like him or who calls into question the way he thinks. Um, and if you don't believe me, just look at the cabinet that he is surrounding himself with. Um, it is the most uh, wealthy, conservative, uh, dangerous group of people uh, that I've seen run government offices uh, in, in my lifetime or what I remember about history. He has a secretary of education who has fought to undermine public education at every step of the way. Uh, the person who's responsible for the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, doesn't believe that climate change is real, despite what all the science says. The Secretary of Energy is somebody who said they would uh, eliminate the Department of Energy. Uh, every person, they have, uh, it seems like the, the least qualified person for the position is who this uh, president-elect is putting in position to lead them, which uh, Jeff Sessions as the attorney general, um, with a president-elect who said he uh, would challenge the unconstitutionality of stop and frisk, uh, which means he is trying to set it up so that police officers can grab people uh, black and brown people off the street just because they happen to be black and brown and search them. Uh, my brothers and sisters, it, it, it seems like, it seems like that we are, are, are sailing into dangerous and stormy waters. Um, and in the midst of that, uh, so many people have been, I, I've talked to people uh, all over the country who've talked about uh, feeling depressed, about crying, um, when they see what's happening, about uh, not knowing what to do or, or, or what happens, or not understanding uh, how this could come about or where to find hope, my brothers and sisters. And what I want to say is that um, uh, if, uh, if our only belief in Jesus is when things are looking good for us, then we really have no belief at all. that the Christmas story is not a story of God moving in when everything was good. It, it is not a story of Jesus coming when people were feeling like there was peace on earth and goodwill toward all men. Uh, nor does it happen in the place where the people were the most optimistic in the empire. Uh, the Christmas story does not uh, happen in Rome in the place of political might or power. It does not happen in Corinth, in the place of trade um, and economic opportunity. It happens in a little town called Bethlehem, a town that nobody wanted to bother with, that nobody cared about, where nobody of any importance had come for over uh, uh, 20 generations, where it was a place of so, so little importance. But it's here that the Christmas story happens. In the context of the surrounding oppression that the Christmas story happens, it is right here where God begins God's greatest work yet in the time where there is the greatest need. 
my, my brothers and sisters, what I'm simply trying to say is that the context of what's happening in the United States, I'm not saying that God did this uh, because I'm not sure God did do this. I think we did this. Uh, uh, my brothers and sisters, but uh, uh, God has a way of taking the things that we do and working them out. It is why Paul says that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose, that God has the way of taking uh, broken pieces of our lives and putting them back together. Uh, If you don't believe me, just take a look back at your own life. And uh, my guess is that if you look back over your life, that you will see the way I do when I look back over my life, that there have been many times where I have messed up my own life, where I've broken the pieces of my own life, where things look like I didn't know how they were going to line up and come back together. But God stepped in and God brought things back together in a way that I could not have imagined. And in the midst of my own failure, God's success shown so much much greater and so if God can do that in our lives and if we can give God praise for what he's done in our lives what makes us think that God cannot move in the same way in the life of our nation my brothers and sisters what I'm simply trying to say is this is not the time for us to give up hope it is not the time for us to wring our hands in despair it's not the time for us to shake our heads but it is the time for us to marshal up the faith that we have it is time for us to marshal up our spiritual belief it is time for us to gather all of the hope we have and place it right there in the manger with Mary and Joseph with this baby and believe that If God has changed the course of history before, God can do it again. God can do it again, my brothers and sisters. Uh, The songwriter said, be not dismayed. Whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you, my brothers and sisters. The message this Christmas is that God is already at work turning this situation around. And all we who believe in God have to do is trust in God and join our work to where God is working so that we can be a part of the miracle that God is birthing even in our midst. It's not the time for us to run away. It's not the time for us to be afraid. But it is time for us to sing the glad tidings of great joy that will be for all people. We have a practice here at Beloved Community Church, brothers and sisters, that we call response to the word. It's our way of saying that God does not just Uh, desire to speak through me, but God is trying to speak to and through each and every one of us. So we put that belief into practice by taking a moment and saying, God, what is it that you're saying to me in this message? What do you have in this message that's for me? And then we take a moment not to to make sure we don't just keep it to ourselves, but to turn and share with a friend or a neighbor so that we can share with them what God is sharing with us. 